So on the April 11th, 1991 episode of Later with Bob Costas, actress Karen Allen appears. And she talks at length about her very successful film career, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously, and Starman, uh, Animal House. I mean, which guy my age didn't go to college thinking they were going to find a girl like that, you know? And uh, what would it be, Boone? <laughs> Anyhow, she, she also talks about her co-star in Animal House, Jim Belushi, whose fame skyrocketed during that that time. And he used to take her out to go see blues music and stuff and confided in her the struggles of dealing with his fame. Uh, interesting, she's just not a pretty face with great eyes and a smile. But she also played Helen Keller on Broadway and had uh, basically learned to speak like a deaf mute person learning to speak and uh, got a lot of acclaim for that. She also appeared in Woody Allen's Manhattan. All those topics are addressed in this episode, so enjoy. Thanks for staying up later. Karen Allen is with us tonight. She was, as you know, Marion Ravenwood, the first heroine in the Raiders of the Lost Ark trilogy, but we're not going to start there. We're going to start with Starman, which was... Uh, an enchanting movie of five or six years ago, a, a John Carpenter film that uh, I understand you were, weren't 100% sold on. It took you a while to agree to do it. Is that true? Well, I read the script, and I set it down, and I thought, what a beautiful story. Um, I remember being initially just um, very impressed with the writing and with the actual st storytelling in the script. But I was a little apprehensive about playing the character, just, I think, because of the circumstances that the character is in, um, that, the, that she meets a man or a being who has sort of come from outer space, has sort of reconstituted um, her mm -hmm. husband's physical body and image, and um, I think it was just one of those difficult sort of what ifs, you know, what if uh, my husband passed away, I woke up in the middle of the night one night and a being from another planet and sort of, and I just thought, I, I wasn't certain how you go about creating that believably. You must have thought it had some potential, no matter how skillful the people involved were, some potential to be either absurd or schmaltzy or both. I think I had a, a certain amount of fear of that. And, and I suppose, I don't, you know, actually, I don't know if Jeff ever did. Um, I remember John Carpenter telling me Jeff walked in um, with the character when Jeff, when uh, uh, John first met him. And Jeff had sort of come up with, he'd been watching his children and watching birds. And he had sort of come up with this sort of like um, behavior that had to do with sort of everything being new, everything being a discovery, everywhere his eye landed was this whole new discovery of something. And uh, Now that you say it, mentioning watching birds, there was that little movement of the neck and that kind of thrust of the face that, that he affected there. Yeah. Someone who studied uh, at the Strasbourg studio and has done uh, lots of stage work, Animal House is an interesting note <laughs> on your resume. <laughs> yeah. Did you have reservations about it or was it at a stage of your career where you said, hey, this could be good, I gotta grab this? Um. I didn't have reservations about it. I, I read it. I thought it was um, funny. I liked the character. I liked Katie. Uh, I found her very uh, relatable, too. Um, she, she really got to be the voice of reason in the film. Um, and I just had a great time. It was a wonderful group of actors that they, they put together for the film. And um, no, I didn't. Somebody told me that during the course of that, or shortly after it, I, I forget which, you had a conversation with Belushi about the nature of fame. Hmm. I did. Um, well, what, I guess, you know, Animal House was really, he had done a little part in Going South. Is that, is that I forget the right, what, the if, film? It, if that, he, he was in there, but I, I... But Animal House was his first film, although he was quite well known already from Saturday Night Live. And I, at the time, was, was a sort of mad harmonica player, and I had brought all my harmonicas and everything to the set of Animal House, yeah. or not to the set, but we would all play music afterwards. And 
Um, so he would come from time to time and pound on my door in the village where I was living and sort of want me to come out to some blues clubs and hear some great uh, harmonica players, guitarists, singers. Um, and I do remember having a very touching conversation with him about, I think, you know, he, he found it an extremely difficult adjustment to make to suddenly, you know, become extraordinarily famous. Um, and I think in, in some way he was trying to show, you know, I had just come to New York. I'd been in New York about four or five months when I had been hired to do Animal House. And I think he was trying on some level to warn me or to share some of his experience with me of, of, of what it felt like to, to suddenly have so much attention on you and so much to be in the spotlight to such an extent. And I don't think it, you know, I remember feeling that he was extremely uncomfortable with it. Do you do a tentative little dance yourself with the idea of stardom? A lot of the reviews of your work have been close to rhapsodic, and you've been in, you've been in uh, at least two tremendously successful films, uh, The Raiders of the Lost Ark and, uh, and Starman, and, and there have been, been others. But I think it's fair to say that you're not a megastar. Yeah. Is that circumstance or, or a distance that you purposely keep? Gosh, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I just like going about having a career in my own way. And, and I don't feel that I've really sort of pursued fame necessarily, pursued uh, big pictures. Uh, um, a lot of times when I've, I've done a film, as opposed to really feeling like, okay, now I've got to go and build this incredible film uh, career. <clears throat> a lot of times the next thing that will come along is a, is a play and I'll end up mm -hmm. off, you know, up at the Long Wharf or something doing a play. And I suppose there are people who, who um, you know, in the industry who don't quite understand my, my, my approach. I don't know whether I'm shy of sort of um, fame or... or uh, you know, building any sort of specific career. I just know that my interests sort of seem to create my own, my own path uh, in acting, and that I, I like doing both. I like doing something which is as high profile as a film, and then I like going off and doing something a little bit more private yeah. and more personal, which I find is, is the way I feel about the theater, that it's a much more intimate experience with the audience. Is Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, a plus all the way across the board, or was it in some sense kind of an unwelcome signature for you? I think it's been... What happens, I think, a lot of times when one film is enormously successful, you get so identified with that film until you're in another film that is equally successful or more successful. Well, it's pretty difficult to make a film that's going to be more successful than Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I think in that sense, um, I, I made the film 10 years ago. And in that sense, that film has sort of followed me through the years and through an enormous amount of, of other work that I've done. Somehow, people always hearken back to, to Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is, is great in a, in a certain way. But at the same time, um, I think that happens to all actors. Yeah. Um, that there is one film or two films that somebody gets identified with. I think in the way that, that it's difficult in, in certain ways because a lot of times um, I might be interested in playing a character in films that's enormously different than Marion Ravenwood or uh, even Jenny Hayden in, Star in Starman. And that very often what happens is you kind of get put in a niche or people identify you with, mm -hmm. with a certain type of film or a certain type of character. And that you have to work very hard to break that mold, to break out of that, to, to make people see you differently. <laughs> Your hands feel colder 
one thing about your Marion Ravenwood, obviously Indiana Jones needs a heroine, but it would have been too cliched for her to be a true damsel in distress. So you had to show some grit. You pop him in the nose right off the bat. Right. You got guys throwing knives at you, and, and they got flaming whips and stuff, and, and you're still holding fast in the face of this danger. That was the twist that, that gave it something other than, like, let's just update, you know, test true heart tied to the railroad tracks or something. Yeah. Yes. I, I re and I really wanted her to be that way, too. I, I felt like I, I had to get in there and, and fight to not have her become, on some level, a, a damsel in distress. Um, because a little bit, the, 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 I think the story initially had been written that way, that she sort of starts off as this very, very tough heroine, and then um, once she gets away from that bar in Nepal, and once we've seen this sort of wonderful, steely character, um, you know, you put her in this little white dress with no back and rip it off in little high heels. <laughs> Suddenly <laughs> she's just helpless. Um, but I didn't want her to become helpless, even in her little white dress and her little high heels. You had, uh, you've had several stage roles, obviously, but one that's particularly interesting to me is Helen Keller, about 20 years after where most people visualize her from The Miracle Worker, and Jane Alexander played the Annie Sullivan yeah. uh, character. How did you, how did you go about um, portraying Helen Keller and knowing that you were getting it close to right? What what was the process? Well, I, I began with a number of things. Her, her voice was, became a very important part of the process for me. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time with um, children who were learning, deaf children who were learning mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and I think one thing that was very liberating is I began to realize that, that um, there is no deaf voice, that, that each child and each adult had their own specific problems in, in terms of, of learning to speak, and that Helen did too. And then I began to listen to a lot of recordings of her voice, and I got a lot of the, the tapes, um, films of her. There's some amazing ones of her and Annie. Back, they were on a vaudeville circuit for a while, which most people don't know. She and Annie hit the road, really, to make a living and went on a vaudeville circuit, and they would explain how Annie had taught Helen to speak. Um, what I had to do also had a little bit of creative or theatrical license, which is Helen's voice was very difficult to understand, mm -hmm. and Annie very often would translate for Helen. But um, I, of course, because it was a play, had to improve her voice enough that the audience mm -hmm. could understand what, what I was saying. How did you teach yourself not to focus? How did you get a sort of haze around yourself? Um, there were a lot of really interesting problems with the character. I had to be able to hear because I had cues. Mm -hmm. um, I had to be able to see because I literally had to walk onto the stage and I had to move through the rooms. And even though I had learned to use furniture and things on the floor as reference points, um, there still had to be a sense of knowing where people were on the stage, knowing where the stage ended. And, and um, so what I learned to do is I learned to literally relax the muscles in the eyes that we use to focus. And I would relax those, and my eye would, wouldn't really see anything, except I would have some sense of peripheral vision where I would notice movement. But what it, what it did is it allowed me, as the character, to sort of be in a place of belief where um, I really believed I wasn't seeing, even though on some level, of course, I was. You, you couldn't react to movement, at least not No, I noticeable. couldn't react to it, but I, I very often had to know yeah. that the movement was taking place. It, so it's very difficult. It, was, it, it, it took place over a long period of time to be able to have someone come toward you and to not instantly do the things that we sure. normally naturally do in response to someone extending a hand towards you or um, and and with the voice it was it was even more difficult because um, I couldn't hear inflections when people would speak to me so things Jane Alexander as Annie would spell something into my hand and speak at the same time mm -hmm. but I couldn't respond to her 
as though I had any awareness of the inflection or of the attitude or the emotion in her voice. I had to respond completely in relationship to what she was doing to my hand. How do you go about assessing where you stand in, in a stage performance? Because except for maybe opening night or something, there's, there's nothing on tape or on film. How do, you, how do you evaluate it? That's an interesting question. It's, for me, it's mostly instinct. Um, there are always areas uh, that usually when I even begin the, the first night in front of an audience up until the opening night, sometimes up until the very last performance, where there are areas of the play that just elude me, or s elements of the character that continue to elude me, moments of, in the relationships between the characters. And I think just instinctively I'm very aware of what those are. And I, I focus on them little by little by little. And sometimes there are just those wonderful accidents. Uh, you'll come on stage in a very different frame of mind one night, and the scene will go very differently. And suddenly, you'll, you'll understand something about the scene that you've never mm -hmm. understood before. And probably it has to do with getting away from the, your uh, uh, intellectual idea of what the scene is about, and just really being in the moment and playing off the other actors and, and being alive with the words. And suddenly, it, it be something that has been completely unclear for weeks or months can suddenly be true for the first time. Back with Karen Allen, into the little known facts file we go. <laughs> you were in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, you enjoyed it, you had a nice meal, and then you left Manhattan and went to the Bronx. <laughs> you, were, you, were, you were in Manhattan, and what was your role in this fine film? Um, well, you have to remember, at the point, Woody Allen plays a writer who is extremely unhappy with, with the, his writing for this program, which is a, a comedy. And there's a point in which he's up in a booth, and the show is going on down below, and he's talking about how terrible his writing is and, and how bad the show is. And there are t he's surrounded by, I think there are two men up there who are popping pills and saying, here, have a Valium. And he yeah. keeps going on and complaining about it. And down on the stage, on the sound stage, you see three comedians who are doing a bit, um, a little skit. And um, it's, we're doing, I think it's an interview skit we were doing. And I'm playing. Um, the wife of a close personal friend of Jimmy Connors, uh, not Jimmy Connors, Jimmy Carter's. And um, <laughs> I'm catatonic. It's an interesting <laughs> slip, though. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I'm catatonic. And um, it came, it, this came out of an idea that I had. We, Woody Allen hadn't had a chance to write us something. And so he had basically said, we're going to go up and shoot this. And you three just make up. A bit, uh -huh. um, and I, he wanted it to sort of be um, in poor taste. So we had come up with a, a, a bit, which was going to be like a game show, uh, sort of name that neurosis or name that psychosis. And I was going to play a catatonic, and the doctor was going to bring me on, and it was going to be a sort of silly kind of idea. Uh -huh. And in the end, we changed and incorporated another idea, and I ended up still playing the catatonic. Um, so it's just little flashes. It cuts back and forth and back and forth. But um, I'm not surprised you don't <laughs> you don't remember it. You've written a screenplay. Yes. Um, about seven years ago, I read a book by Walker Percy called *The Second Coming*, which is just an extraordinarily beautiful story. Basically, a love story um, set in the South um, in the early '80s, and. Um, I've written the, the screenplay to that, and we're in the process of it's headed towards being made as a film now. And you'd appear in it as well, right? I don't think I would, oh, actually. Really? No. Um, there may have been a point years ago when I first encountered the material that I had thought that um, the, the, there's a role of a, a woman named Allison Huger. Um, that I had thought I wanted to play. I think my, my first fascination with the material was really the character. But now that I've become so much more involved with the writing of it, um, I think it's very difficult to try and do both. I don't think I'd want to continue to work on the screenplay and try to act mm -hmm. in the film simultaneously. Well, Karen Allen put in a half an hour. She didn't have to dodge any daggers or <laughs> shriek at snakes. 
On the other hand, no handsome guy came down from outer space to whisk her away either, so it's a mixed bag. We're out of here. See you later.